am honored and excited for the opportunity to serve today as the moderator uh, on the topic, the ceiling norm or planning for post undergraduate life. Um, as you heard in my introduction, um, I am the CEO of a foundation here in Marietta, Georgia, focused on expanding equity um, for students in secondary schools and expanding their post-secondary pathways. Uh, today's program, as you may be aware, is sponsored by the Latinx Mathematicians Research Community, sponsored by AIM and NSF, and organized by Jesus Delora and Pam. Pamela Harris. So here's today's focus. The unspoken and obstructive rules in mathematical sciences and hidden norms of graduate school, postgraduate life, industry, and the transition between those stages. Our distinguished panel has been introduced, but to cover some of the highlights, I personally enjoyed reading about them. Um, in their extraordinary achievements. Uh, Dr. Gwen Spencer, BS in math from Harvey Mudd College, recipient of the Watson Fellowship, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, the Sherry Lowen Stuhl Fellowship, the Cornell Graduate Fellowship, and an MS and PhD from Cornell in Operations Research. Oops. Here we go. Dr. Yen Duong grew up in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Early influences included the University of Minnesota uh, program for gifted students in math, a graduate of the Troy High School magnet program in Fullerton, California, BA in math and philosophy from Yale, recipient of the Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship, MS, from UC Santa Barbara, PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. I'm a native of Chicago. Um, and she's married with three children. I neglected to men mention that Dr. Spencer has a newborn. And then our third panelist, the esteemed um, software engineer, Mr. Anthony Simpson a BA in computer science and mathemat mathematics from Williams College, had a software internship as a software engineer at Facebook, math teaching assistant at Williams College, math research assistant at Williams College, summer science program tutor, software developer at TCC Software Solutions, research institute at Max Planck, Institute for Software Systems in Saarbrücken, Germany, and is currently an outstanding, highly accomplished software engineer with Facebook. We have an extraordinary panel. So today's guiding questions, what are the hidden norms and obstructive rules encountered when pursuing graduate programs? What are the hidden norms and obstructive rules encountered when pursuing jobs in industry? And what are the hidden norms and obstructive rules encountered with pursuing alternative routes through academia? The format is going to be as indicated on the screen. We're going to attempt to allocate 15 minutes to each topic. Any panelist may respond to a topic. And as Daniel has already indicated, um, you will need to hold your questions until the end or you can place questions into the chat and we will uh, address those questions and our panelists may respond to them during the 30 minute Q&A segment at the end of the panel. Topic one, question one, graduate programs. How does the undergraduate experience, college choice, mentors, research, internships and advisors impact graduate school and fellowship opportunities? Any of our panelists may respond. Happy to jump in here. Um, I think that a really big factor 
in graduate school fellowships. And I'm not just talking about funding for graduate school because funding for PhD programs uh, is pretty typical in STEM fields. But in terms of fellowships that go above and beyond sort of stipend opportunities tied to teaching assistantships, a lot of those fellowships want to see substantial sort of personal independent research. And so thinking during college about how you can demonstrate interest in research and grow your experience around research, either through course-based independent studies, maybe with faculty members, summer opportunities in research, uh, REUs are like summer, uh, summer research opportunities that you can apply for across institutions in the US. Uh, the more sort of independence you can demonstrate around an interest in learning on open-ended large-scale problems, sort of the meatier your fellowship applications for graduate school will be. I wanna add in there that I didn't know this before, REUs are paid um, or many of them are. So like you don't have to worry so much about getting a job over the summer, you can get your REU and you'll still have money. Um, let's see, here, I'll do my thing. Oh, can I share my screen, Michael? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this is just some programs that I did during undergraduate um, Budapest semesters in math, which a lot of people have done. I don't know that it helps your applications for graduate school, but it might help you personally. I was saying earlier, the, my semester at, in Budapest was what kind of tipped me over the edge to grow to graduate school because I was finally hanging out with math people and learned how to do math with other people. Um, I also had this Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship for um, minorities underrepresented in academia, uh, which probably helped out and it did help me during graduate school. It's a continuing fellowship, so they help pay for my computer and such. Um, and then, like Dr. Spencer mentioned, the REUs, which are paid, so check them out. Maybe one other point that I'd like to add is just that when you're thinking about fellowships and graduate school applications, whether it's for master's degrees or PhDs, you should be thinking about who you're going to ask for letters of recommendation. And those people will be um, not just writing you letters, but also helping you think about what schools to apply for. Uh, so, so thinking early about relationships that you're developing by taking classes with like a common professor maybe who's seen you in a couple of courses, uh, that can be a really huge contributor to applications, both to get into graduate school and for uh, fellowships that will fund that opportunity. Outstanding. Okay, question number two. What specific actions can students take during their undergraduate experience to maximize graduate school and fellowship opportunities or, or and to identify the right graduate school? Um, go to office hours. I'd say that's like one of the number one things that undergraduates can and should do. Um, otherwise you're just sort of like a name in an Excel spreadsheet. You wanna be a face. Like Dr. Spencer mentioned, you want good rec letters. You don't want just like a, this person was in my class, but like they came to office hours, they were prepared. Don't just show up and not know anything, show up with at least a question. Um, and that question could simply be like, I thought this was cool in class. Can you tell me more about it? Because math people love talking about math. So you just get, get us started and we'll keep going. Um, so I'd say go to office hours is like the number one action. And that'll also help you identify um, a good graduate program because all these mathematicians know each other. So a good advisor will be able to help you figure out what's right for you. Would any of our other panelists like to comment? I think um, for me, what I, what I kind of did to, uh, I, I didn't go to graduate school, but I kind of went on like a long process of figuring that out. Um, and the, the thing that helped me do that was just signing up for like any job that was available to me. So I, I, you saw I did the uh, 
teaching assistant at Williams College. I was a research assistant. I went back and did a summer science program. So, you know, initially I was trying to get a, a feel for, you know, whether or not I enjoyed teaching, uh, whether or not I enjoyed research. And, you know, thankfully I did find a professor that I enjoyed doing research with. Um, but I, I still didn't see myself doing like uh, math professionally, I guess, I guess it's like my uh, grad school option. Um, so even after that, I considered, uh, you know, the, the internship at the Max Planck Institute uh, was, was supposed to see it, you know, give me, an, give me some experience in research and computer science even to see if I wanted to do grad school on, on, in that route. Um, and I, I still didn't, uh, but it, all of these experiences kind of like helped me come to those decisions. Well, I have an experience that the audience might benefit from. One of our students was attending the University of Maryland, Baltimore County as a Meyerhoff scholar. And as a first year student, there was a seminar and there was a professor of economics from Harvard University. After the seminar, he went up to the professor to ask him questions. He was the only student that did so. And then in that conversation, he asked the professor if he knew of any internships. And the professor arranged for an internship at Harvard. That was the first year. Because of that first year, going up to the professor, eventually, this past year, he graduated from UMBC and was selected as a 2021 Rhodes Scholar and will be attending graduate school at the University of Oxford. But it goes back to that one encounter at a lecture when he got up out of his seat, he went and talked to the professor. Think about it. I want to just plus one everything that folks have said in answer to this question. I think a lot of students don't realize that office hours time or, or time that faculty have allocated to talk to students, actually surprisingly few students show up for that time. Um, my experience uh, teaching at a liberal arts school is that I often had students who would come to my office hours and they would apologize to me for having so many questions. And I would say to them, like, look, this time is your time. Like, I've scheduled it exactly for this reason. Like, I, I'm thrilled to have you here in office hours asking me questions. And some of the strongest recommendation letters that I've written for students for uh, graduate programs or, or also other kinds of opportunities post-college have been because of relationships that students sought out with me. Uh, there was a time when a student came back in a different course, an AI course, an artificial intelligence course that she was taking after taking an intro course with me. And she said, I know there's a connection between this problem I'm working on and what we talked about in your class. You know, can we work through this together? And, uh, you know, that, that student, I was able to write them a really strong recommendation letter when it came time to apply for their masters. Outstanding. So this next question may even uh, tie into the informal conversations that students have with professors and, and uh, reflecting on your own experience. At what point during your undergraduate experience did you decide to pursue a PhD or into the workplace and why? I guess I mentioned this earlier. So I was a math and philosophy major, not a pure math major. Uh, not sure what I was going to do after college. And I went to this Budapest Semesters in Math program and realized that I actually liked the math nerds, uh, which I just didn't do during undergrad. Uh, we were cool. I mean, it was cool to do math with other people. And that's when I learned about REUs. And that's really when I learned about grad school also, just from my peers. Um, and I was like, well, this is really fun. I guess I'll just keep trying to do this. Um, and that's why I decided to go for the PhD. Outstanding. Anthony, you went into the workplace. You have to talk to us, Anthony. Tell yeah. us why. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I kind of had those, those, that laundry list of like jobs, you know, trying out teaching and uh, the research. And I, I did really enjoy, uh, doing research in, in math, like either working on a problem or, you know, doing programming to solve a problem. Um, but I, I think I realized long-term that it wasn't a, something I wanted to do as a career. Um, so I, I really didn't decide against a PhD fully until I was all the way out of undergraduate in, in Germany doing that internship. 
Um, and when, once I got there, I realized that computer science research and math research are very, very different. <laughs> uh, like, uh, you go for the same goal of, you know, producing papers for publishing, but, you know, a lot of the research is like building a system and, you know, a, a system that people won't ever really use. Um, and I realized I wanted kind of like that hands-on direct impact of like actually putting out a product that people would be using and, you know, it would be tested against. Um, I, I thought that at the time it, it's actually turned out to be very painful uh, since joining uh, full time. But I, I, I think, yeah, that, that that's what did it for me. Um, kind of having like, I guess, not as uh, far out goals on, on the PhD. You know, you, you might be working for five or seven years on like uh, that single problem, you know, on, on the grinding stone, whereas every, every day at uh, Facebook, there's just like a litany of things to do that have like direct immediate impact. Um, so it's, it's almost kind of a more immediately gratifying work, working in an industry, I think. At least that was the conclusion I came to. Outstanding. Let, Anthony, let me also ask you um, if you could clarify something for our audience. Oftentimes there's, there's a misunderstanding of students pursuing careers in math science, and particularly where you are, software uh, engineering um, through a liberal arts undergraduate experience. How did your liberal arts undergraduate experience prepare you for the work that you're doing? Um, Williams computer science program is like very heavily theoretical. So you kind of get like a foundational understanding of the systems that you're working on are, are the algorithms behind why uh, some approach works. Um, and, and I found that that's been like immensely more helpful than just, you know, knowing how to do something outright. I, I feel like the, the liberal college experience has kind of helped me in a sense, like learn how to learn. I mean, I've been able to apply that since coming into industry, whether or not I had like the uh, hard skills background. So, so yeah, I, I did a, a lot of like theoretical computer science. I did some like low level systems, engineering um but by and large when i got to facebook i didn't know anything about you know building systems at scale um but kind of on the job i've, I've just been able to uh pick up those tools and you know make progress where needed whenever i uh, run into like roadblocks outstanding and dr spencer did you enter cornell planning to pursue a phd yeah, yeah, I did. So actually, before the summer of my junior year, I never had really thought about going to graduate school. And what happened is during the spring of my junior year, I did a kind of an advanced course with a professor that I knew, and I just really enjoyed the course. It was a geometric combinatorics course, pure math course. And near the end of the course, he sort of asked like, hey, do you think you would want to work on this with me over summer? And that was my first taste of research. The previous summer, I had uh, been a teaching assistant for a high school uh, math sort of summer program. So I had not really done research before. I didn't know what it was about, but I really, really enjoyed it that summer. And also a little bit like what Dr. Duong talked about, um, in addition to that summer research, I also went to a program called the Park City Math Institute which is sort of vertically integrated in the sense that it has undergraduates, graduate students, and research mathematicians all thinking about the same topic for about three weeks. And those were sort of the first research mathematicians I had ever met. And I learned there something kind of pivotal, which is that for graduate school in STEM, you don't pay tuition, they pay you a stipend. Uh, either because you're working as a TA or because you're working as a research assistant. And I didn't know that at all before I went to that program. And I just, it was kind of like, people were like, oh yeah, where are you applying to graduate school? You know, like, of course it's funded. Um, and that made me think like, hey, you know, I've been taking out all these loans for my undergraduate, but now apparently I can continue going to school, which I like, but they pay me. So it seemed like a really good deal. And the other thing that I'll say is that I did a very pure math undergrad. And I didn't feel like I had a lot of marketable skills because the career fairs at my school were largely focused on uh, students who had degrees in engineering or in computer science. And I hadn't taken many computational courses. So the kinds of jobs that math majors get typically coming out of undergrad 
weren't as accessible to me as to a student who had taken a little bit more uh, programming, a little bit more sort of applied coursework. And for that reason, I was pretty interested in um, applying to graduate programs. And I didn't start to think seriously about industry until I was quite a ways along the academic path where I would really second what Anthony said about sort of the timeline on which you get to learn if your ideas really hold water in practice, right? In a research role, it can take a huge amount of time to generate an original theorem. And then the degree to which uh, you sort of get feedback about whether that theorem is interesting to the community, that can be a really slow process. But in industry, you have an idea, you build out sort of a system or a way to operationalize it, and you get to learn pretty quickly whether that idea is robust enough, a strong enough idea to really uh, do something efficiently or um, kind of in, uh, in an optimal way in the real world, which is pretty exciting, I think. I wanted to add something to what you said there which yes. is that when you're in grad school, your undergrad loans get deferred. So you don't have to start paying them back when you're in grad school. And actually that fellowship I had, the Mellon Mays Fellowship paid off my undergrad loans um, if I got a PhD. So it's a nice, you know, it's a nice perk. Well, on that note, while we've used our entire 15 minutes for this first topic, I do have one final question and uh, I like to address that because I'm, I'm confident that a lot of students who are incurring debt during their undergraduate programs, they need to understand the hidden norms um, of preparation, exposure, admission, and financing graduate school. And I'm sitting here listening to you, and I've heard some things that I didn't know, and I thought that I was pretty knowledgeable uh, about this stuff. So if you all could expand on some of these hidden norms. Uh, I hear that Dr. Spencer found out about it in a program, and then Dr. Joan found out about it uh, through a fellowship. Our audience needs to know about it now. Panelists? Uh, apply, when you apply to PhD programs, if they won't give you money, then you should probably not go. That's my personal opinion. But. Um, at least in math. Um, in many other fields, you might have to pay for graduate school. In many other fields, you might be scrambling your first year to find a lab and then get funding through that. But um, if you're in a pure math PhD program, they should give you money. Outstanding. Yeah, I, to add to that, Dr. Swenson? Yeah, I would say something similar. So typically like a master's degree in lots of different fields is a degree that you pay for with the primary exceptions that I've seen being that there are institutions that have specific master's focused fellowships. There's not very many of them, but in general, a master's degree is like a very focused degree that's uh, getting you ready for some kind of a job. And if, if the master's degree is in a field that's highly compensated, it could make sense to spend money on a master's degree. For example, in computer science or maybe in statistics where within a couple of years after getting your master's, you could be making enough money annually to pay back those loans pretty easily. Um, but exactly as Dr. Duong said, for PhD programs in STEM, uh, the norm is really that they are funded by the institution or by grants that your advisor has and that there's support even before you find an advisor in programs where there's maybe a year or two of general requirements before you're matched to a lab. Um, and I, I would second with what Dr. Duong said that if, if you apply to PhD programs and for some reason are not offered funding, um, probably the best thing is to sort of regroup and take a year to take some advanced courses at a local school and potentially to work in some mildly technical field and then reapply even seeking feedback from the graduate admissions uh, director about what you can do to improve your application. Um, a PhD takes a long time and uh, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty expensive if you pay the sticker price. And I think uh, usually that doesn't happen in STEM. So wait, regroup and reapply is, is my advice in that case. Outstanding. 
Sorry, one last Okay, time. so now we, we went a little past my 15 minute time point, but now we are transitioning into topic number two. Um, I'm gonna ask Anthony to begin to comment on this first question uh, relating to pursuing jobs in industry. Summarize how math has guided your career path and any obstacles that have been encountered. Um, I guess math has kind of guided my career path and in, in, in the fact that it's something that I've just always really enjoyed doing. Um, I kind of, I, I, I'm, came out of a kind of like a lower income area, um, East St. Louis, Illinois. And when I, when I moved out of there, I moved into a high school and I was like failing out of math when I got to, once I, but by the time I was graduating from uh, high school, I kind of knew that it was something that I loved and something that I wanted to constantly be doing. Um, and I, I think finding places or finding positions where I, I feel like I can actually use my math skills has been something that's been kind of guiding me. Um, like for example, I, I mentioned that like uh, one of the hard skills that I felt like I was lacking was kind of building um, bu building uh, large scalable systems at Facebook. Like I didn't I didn't know you know even the basics on what had to go into it. Um, and and so when I when I joined as a full timer, I kind of wanted to get on a team that would give me more exposure to that. And so I put myself out of my uh, my comfort zone by doing that on my first team. Um, and I, I think one, one of the big reasons for that is just kind of like the data comprehension and like statistic analysis that you have to use whenever you're looking at these large systems. Um, like so, so much of my job is staring at uh, dashboards and, you know, different, different like logging sites, um, just trying to make sense of, you know, the patterns that the system is exhibiting when it's in a healthy state. And the patterns that it exhibits when it's in an unhealthy state and kind of being able to root cause from from there um so yeah i, I think in 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 this position I've, I've kind of sought out places that would let me use my math degree um and i i, I think moving forward in, in my career I would, I would definitely uh definitely be looking for, for that and other jobs um obstacles not so much but kind of an interesting one um that that position that i had at tcc software solutions i uh i got that that was, that was an internship when i was just out of my freshman year of college and like people have mentioned before it, it's very hard to get an internship your first year out of college or your first year in college um and so what i did to get that job i, I actually like cold emailed cold called every company in indiana that i could find that was you know you know worth mentioning and i got a single interview and i went to that interview and the guy told me that the main reason that he pulled me in that day was because i had taken abstract analysis or abstract algebra as a freshman and he was like that just seems cool so yeah I, that was uh that kind of got me like right over right over that hurdle it was kind of a, the easiest interview i've had outstanding dr juan you math you're, you're a mathematician but you're a freelance writer. Talk to us about that career path. All right, mind if I share my screen again? Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, so like many people who have switched uh, from a pure math or academic career, like step one is trying to figure out to leave or not, and then you feel really bad so I have this quote here from um, the person who actually taught me abstract algebra when I was at Yale. Uh, and I think he ended up going to Google and then somewhere else after a tenure track job. He's like, it feels completely hopeless, but the more you learn, the better it gets. So hopefully this is helping you. Uh, it can feel hard. So, right, so I've always written, um, I've loved writing and I had a blog in grad school called Baking and Math where I, each week I would either bake something and take pictures of it or I would write up some math that I had learned that week um, and that ended up being really amazing practice uh, so after my PhD I tried looking for jobs and I got like a whole bunch of rejections so I wanted everyone to see these rejection emails and just know that like it's okay you'll fail it's okay you'll get rejected you know like Anthony said he emailed every person in Indiana and got one, but that, you only need one. So, 
after all my rejections, um, oh, there's another one. Uh, I applied for the AAAS Mass Media Fellowship, um, which sends uh, a math person, really it sends grad schools, grad students in STEM or one year out from their graduate degree into newsrooms across the country for the summer. Um, and you learn to write science stuff um, and fun in a fun way the AMS, the American Math Society, uh, sponsors a AAAS Mass Media Fellowship every year. So there's at least one spot for a math person and there's also others, but what's nice is that not that many people apply for the math position. So you, you have a better shot than like the, I don't know, the ecologists or something. Um, so I did this fellowship for a summer. I wrote at the Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, I wrote like 25 stories or something over 10 weeks. It was a lot. And on the weekends, I would commute back home because I have mentioned to have three kids at the time I had two. Uh, and then from that fellowship uh, afterwards, we met in DC and just sort of talked to people. And while we were presenting the things that we had written, I met the American Statistical Association guy and the AMS person. And like, I knew the AWM Association for Women in Mathematics person. So I just started writing um, and I've been writing since then. I did have a staff position with the local news site for a while. And then since then, like jobs just come to me. I don't really pitch. Um, so I just wrote something for MSRI. I invoiced them today. Uh, who did I invoice? Oh, the Simons Foundation. I have a bunch of clients who just hear about the math writer and they ask me about it. So there's, there is space for math writers. If anyone wants to learn about math writing, I'm, I'm a person. There's like maybe 10 of us. So check it out. Outstanding. And, and Dr. Spencer, um, your career pathway has been uh, through academia as a professor and um, into the private sector, and I believe with, with two different startups. Am I correct? Yeah, um, I wouldn't characterize Stripe as a startup at this point. I think there's okay. about three to 4,000 people who work there currently. Um, but I, I think Anthony said something really beautiful a couple of questions ago that uh, resonated with me a lot. So I just want to plus one. The idea that mathematical training goes a, a long way in teaching you how to learn, right? Learning how to learn is a huge benefit of mathematical training. And I think for myself, one of the things that I realized um, after, after getting a faculty position that I loved for a lot of reasons, I loved working with students, but one of the things that led me to consider industry was actually that I wanted to be spending more of my time learning about things I didn't already know. So as a researcher, you're very, very specialized in your area of expertise. And you spend a lot of time kind of like enhancing your understanding of something that you already are one of the top, say 10 experts in the world of thinking about. And to some people that's just like the absolute peak of what they could want in a career. But I think that for me, um, being in an environment where I get to be learning new things every week, if not every day, and also learning new things from folks who know those areas really, really closely, who are expert in the domain area, that was just super motivating to me. And it was actually doing interdisciplinary research with economists and ecologists that made me think like, wow, it could be really, really exciting to be a full-time scientist. And that was part of the reason I made the jump over to industry. And uh, in addition to sort of what Anthony mentioned about seeing that kind of closer to real-time impact of your ideas, just this level of novelty that you get uh, in, in kind of an industrial position was something that math taught me kind of how to love, I think. So before I go to the next question, I, I'd like just a quick comment from each of you about just that, what, what you just said, Dr. Spencer, about when doing your undergraduate experience, when you reflect back, were you just excited every day about going to your math classes, about doing math and figuring things out? Um. There were definitely some that were more painful than others, but <laughs> the, classes, 
<laughs> for the classes that I enjoyed, absolutely. I think uh, my, my favorite class in, in, well, two of two of them was complex analysis and then uh, analytical number theory. Um, and honestly, in, in the number theory class, every day I, we left on a cliffhanger and like I was racing to, <laughs> it was a Tuesday, Thursday class. I was always racing to Thursday. Like I could not wait to uh, see, see what was next in the lecture. Um, but I'm kind of a dork like that, so. <laughs> Next. Nope. I, I did not like my math classes in undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> I was not jazzed for them. I fell asleep in like so many lectures. I was not a great student. Um, <laughs> and like I said, it was really Budapest when I like learned like how joyful it could be to kind of like actually get it and not just feel like I was struggling all the time um, and to talk to people about math and get excited. I think the reason is because in undergrad, I just like did not work with other people. I didn't know that that was a thing that you could do. Um, and I didn't go to office hours. I didn't follow this advice. Um, I was generally not a great math student in undergrad, <laughs> but I did love my philosophy classes. So <laughs> that. So I take it, Dr. Spencer, you love math. You've always loved math. Well, I, you know, I have to, I, I'm not going to lie here. Like, I think, um, I, I think honesty is a good thing to aspire to. So, so both as an undergrad and even as a grad student, when I was in a graduate program that I had chosen with a lot of information from undergrad, there were classes that I didn't love doing the work for. I, you know, there were classes that, you know, occasionally there was a requirement where it was just like, oh, this is just the most painful part of my week, right? But I think that was sort of balanced by having a couple of classes at any given time. And some of them weren't even math classes. You know, as an undergrad, I also just love some of my literature courses. Like every semester, I had a couple of courses I really looked forward to. Uh, like Anthony said, it was just like, I couldn't wait to get to the next session. And so even if there was that class where every time I had to do the homework set, I would just cry about like how boring and terrible that homework set was, um, you know, sort of, I knew that I would get more and more control over how I was spending my time and I would be able to sort of focus in on the parts of my study that I really loved. Um, yeah, yeah, but let's, let's be honest, let's be honest. Nobody <laughs> likes every class they take, right? Well, this has been a, a good conversation and we're coming up against our 15 minute time limit. So uh, what are the barriers and benefits to pursuing math related careers in industry? How about a two minute response? How about a one minute response? Um, I, I think the only thing I would say on this is it, it coming as someone that, I, you know, I got the computer science degree, but for math, I was mostly pure math. I didn't do um, much else like applied otherwise. Um, and so it, it seems like there are a lot of jobs that just that felt like they were out of uh, my depth or out of my league. Um, there, there are so many jobs though that uh, will provide like on the job training, like as soon as you're hired. So they're not really expecting you to have any skills coming in. This is like on like risk assessment, um, finance, even if you go to like the NSA or FBI, they'll, they'll train you on their methods and you know, the tools that they're using. So it's, it's not necessarily expected that you have to, uh, you know, know everything or, you know, honestly for me, I, I didn't feel competent going into the field and you know, that, that's okay if, if you're starting at these jobs. Um. Yeah, I think studying math can make you a master learner, but then also another thing that Anthony said, right? You go into an interview and someone is like, you took abstract algebra as a freshman, right? What it signals to other people that you kind of were interested in math is sometimes super helpful at certain points. And it's almost confusing, I think, to folks who took math classes because they love them right, to then be out in the world and have someone say like, oh, you must be sort of a genius. And the amount of confidence that they have in you because you happen to really like this particular math topic, sometimes it's just like an incredible sort of shortcut uh, to people thinking like, oh, okay, this person can do anything. Uh, yeah, Dr. Right, John, you want to weigh in on this one? No, that's it. I I think probably one of the biggest barriers for me personally is um, kind of getting over that hump, that that mental block that like, I can only do math. I like can't do anything else. I'm like such a weirdo and I haven't learned anything, you know, in school 
that I can use in outside world. And it's like, you got to get over that hump and realize, no, you know, a ton of stuff. You, you are so good at stuff. Um, and everyone else thinks you're good at stuff too. Like you said, you know, you do math. Ooh. So, you know, accept that. Like, yeah, I am awesome. Outstanding. You are awesome. So uh, question number three, and we're at my 15 minute limit. Let's see. What do you love most and least about the career pathway that you've chosen? Oops. Oh, I guess I'll be honest. Uh, when, when crunch time is on for some of the systems that I work on, like I'm working 60 to 80 hour weeks sometimes, which is a terrible work-life balance. It's not necessarily like required that you uh, work that much, but it, it kind of just happens. <laughs> um, that, that's probably what I have enjoyed the least, but honestly, the, uh, the work that I'm doing it's, it's very easy to stay up to like 2 a.m. programming. So it's, it's still something that I uh, really enjoy and kind of get value out of whether I'm like probably doing it more than I want to be. Outstanding. Um, I love exactly what I loved in grad school and undergrad for that matter. I love the flexibility. I love being able to make my own schedule um, and just be beholden to myself. I don't do well in hierarchy. Um, so I don't think a corporate job is, would be exactly perfect for me, but, uh, being my own boss is awesome and I love it. And that's probably also the thing I like the least about it too, because I'm only accountable to myself. So like, maybe I just want to eat chocolate and watch movies. And then I'm like, no, don't eat chocolate and watch movies. Like go do work. Um, and it would be nice if I had someone else saying like, yeah, you can't eat chocolate and watch movies. Like just, just to have someone else to be accountable to, I think would be nice sometimes. Yeah, in terms of things that I love the most, I would say it's the amount of time that I get to do creative technical problem solving as a data scientist. That's like sort of the biggest advantage for me of having made the transition from academia to industry. Um, I would also mention that in terms of flexibility, even working at a company where there's sort of long hours sometimes, uh, in technical roles, it is really a seller's market in the sense that if you're dissatisfied with your position, you're getting cold called constantly by recruiters in whether you're a software engineer, whether you're a data scientist, whether you're a data analyst, et cetera, um, trying to get you to come to their company, trying to show you like a set of benefits and a position that's intriguing to you. And it really, it, it's really a huge confidence boost to get sort of constant inquiries about people who are excited about bringing you to their company. I'm sure Anthony just gets a ton of inquiries. Facebook has an excellent reputation. If you're there and you're thriving, other companies are just trying to headhunt you all the time, right? Um, so, so that's like super flattering, right? Uh, and it's not really something that happens in academia. I would say that the thing that I miss the most about academia is working directly with students. That was a really incredible part of my job. And I loved having the opportunity to do that in the earlier part of my career. But I think it's also really, really natural to seek different kinds of rewards in different parts of your career. Like you don't have to have like a single dream about what you're gonna do for 30 years. That's not kind of the career space that we live in now. You can pursue different kinds of roles at different times and um, they're gonna reward you in really different ways. So we're, we're taking a little time away from our final um, topic, but I feel it's important if you could just quickly address this issue. Um, what are the hidden norms and the challenges to employment and promotion for mathematicians and in industry? And I think that what I'm hearing is that um, if you, once you can get into industry as a mathematician, that there simply are huge opportunities because you're in demand. Yeah, I, I definitely think like the, the, the fields are so in demand that it's not going to be hard to get interviews. I think the interviews are probably the, uh, the hardest part about it. Um, for, for me, I have not passed a single like full time job interview, like, not not once. Like, they, there are like 
three to five rounds each normally. And I'll normally get to the fourth or fifth round, but then after that, it's kind of nerves and practice is kind of like what decides it. Um, so, so that seems like to be one of the uh, bigger challenges for me, at least going into like the software industry. Um, but the, the thing about it is that like the number of problems that they'll ask you are finite, so you can practice. Um, and the way that they want you to answer the question is uh, answer the questions is to show not just your knowledge, but how you work and how you collaborate with people. Um, and those are also skills that are easy to develop. And like, if you are also working with like your friends looking for jobs right now, they're like the perfect people to run like mock interviews with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a high barrier, but definitely doable. Um, there's a few books on this topic. So I really liked, so what are you going to do with about, so what are you going to do with that? Um, which is a book about transitioning from PhD or from academia into industry. There's another one called The Professor is In that I've heard good things about. So I don't have a slide with these. And then there's another one called A PhD is Not Enough. Um, so they, these are entire books basically on this question. Um, so I'd suggest checking them out. So I, I would raise one, one question then for our audience, um, because we, um, are, there, are there gender issues or Anthony, are there racial issues that hinder um, um, the progress of mathematicians through the employment market, even if you're in STEM or is STEM such a field that your skills are so highly valued that they transcend gender and race. They don't. They don't transcend. Um, like it is is those are definitely still real issues. And you know, one of the, one of the things I like about Facebook is that they're very open and honest about like the programs that they're trying to have, so that they can uh, bring more equality and equity in in terms of like gender and race relations. Um, on on the gender front, they're doing a lot better. Uh, on the race front, not as much. Um, so, so when I joined Facebook at the Boston office back in 2017 as an intern, I, I count myself as like the first black intern there because there was no one else. Um, and then once I came back for my second internship, the one full-time black engineer had been hired. Um, so all, all men, but, and you know, only two black people. Uh, but I, I also have confidence that it, it can get better. Um, the thing at Facebook that I, I liked the most was that everything is kind of, up to the employees, not everything, but if you're interested in something or making something better, then there, there's a lot of room for doing that. They have a lot of programs that kind of uh, bring people in from unconventional avenues. So like rotational programs. So if you don't have like the, even a BA in computer science and you just like developed your programming skills, uh, that that's an option that you can uh, go through that will end in full-time employment if, if you know the rotational program goes well. Um, there's also programs for like reaching out and teaching in, you know, underrepresented schools and just things like that. So I, I feel like it's definitely not a solved issue, but there are things in place that are trying to help. And, you know, being someone on the inside now, I feel like I'm, I'm getting the chance to make that situation better myself. All right. So we're going to trans transition into our final topic and, and bring these issues together. Um, as we look at alternative routes through academia. Um, so panelists, would you share your insight from your unique vantage point of having navigated alternative routes through academia and their respective pros and cons? And again, for the benefit of, of our audience, anything that has been unique obstacles that you've had to confront or overcome um, and also, if you could speak to your institutions, I mean, two Ivy League and the number one liberal arts school in the country in Williams, um, for many of our panel, many of our, our audience, they're not attending those types of institutions. So have you experienced advantages in your career pathway as a result of where you received, you attended your undergraduate school? That's a lot to unpack. For me, absolutely. Um, going to Williams College, I I kind of didn't have any idea about you know graduate school or what like research really looked like. Um, 
and even at Williams, when I was there, I, I got on as like a uh, computer science research assistant, but I was doing like really grunt work, like uh, labeling data points for somebody else's project. Um, so nothing that was like very intense. Um, and it, it was really luck that uh, Professor Harris came to Williams College and, you know, she is very into doing research with students like she, she makes that like an absolute priority for her. Um, so, you know, someone emailed and said, hey, are you interested in doing research? And I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I signed up, I got that opportunity kind of out of the blue and signed up for it. And it, it took me very far, you know, I, I did research with Professor Harris for all of sophomore year, even some when I was abroad in uh, Budapest. Um, and then senior year, I came back and did a thesis with her and, you know, went to various conferences with her, worked with like the uh, community of mathematicians that she works with. Um, I, I think, yeah, that, that definitely gave me that advantage. Um, I guess it, it was less so the institution though than um, the professor. I, I feel like having, having this one professor that I could come to and know that we could collaborate on projects that, uh, you know, she would take me to conferences or take me to talks or expose me to like literature reviews or help me with, uh, um, sorry, a message popped up. That she would help me with uh, editing papers, things like that. That That's what really get, got me into um, the, doing math research. And I think, you know, no matter the institution that you're at, if, if you can find a professor that is like that for you, you know, someone that can be an advisor, uh, that, that helps navigate the space so much, so much more. Good insight. Dr. Spencer? Yeah, I mean, I would also sort of highlight this um, strength of personal connection with a faculty member as having given me access that I would have never had access and also just like ideas about what I could aspire to. Um, so I did, I did research that junior summer in college, as I mentioned, with a professor I had taken a course with. And before that, no one had really talked to me about the possibility of graduate school. I actually hadn't thought about what jobs I might try to get either. Um, so I think that for me, that personal connection, which was a little bit on the initiative of the faculty member, but also sort of on my initiative, made a huge difference in what I ended up doing. Um, Personally, I'll also mention here that uh, when I think of alternative routes through academia, one thing that comes to mind is the difference between going sort of straight through from undergrad to grad school versus taking time off after graduates or after undergrad to figure out what kind of program you might be interested in and whether you're interested in an academic uh, program after undergrad at all. I think um, I applied to graduate school as a senior undergrad because I didn't feel like I was employable. Uh, and then after I accepted a graduate program, it was like my future was set for five years, right? I knew what track I was on. I think that a lot of my own students, having heard from me that students in my graduate program often finished faster if they had taken time off, right? Because they they had taken time away, they were more focused, they were really intentional in what grad programs they are applying for. Um, students that I taught have often taken a year or two to work, uh, put some money in the bank, gave some perspective about what kinds of skills and what kinds of careers they're interested in, and then either come back for a master's or a PhD, or alternately have already gained this seniority and in industry that allows them to get really interesting roles where they have a lot of independence and agency on the problems they work on. And so I think that some faculty think like, oh, if you step away from academia, like you can't kind of come back. They're worried about students losing momentum. But from my personal observation, sometimes it can be a great step. So Dr. Spencer, before I go to Dr. John, um, there was something you said that I'm a little confused on, and I'm sure our audience is confused. Tell us how you attend an Ivy League school, majoring in math, and you feel in your senior year that you're not implorable. Oh, well, so I was, I was at Harvey Mudd, um, and I think oh, that sorry, a lot I'm of, sorry. a lot of I, the degrees at Harvey Mudd are right. like more practical than my pure math degree. 
So they're like explicitly engineering degrees or they're explicitly computer science degrees. And you go to a career fair and there's just, you know, 60 companies that want to hire engineers, 20 companies that want to hire CS majors. And you give them your, your one page resume that says like math major, I proved these theorems. And they're like, what, what is this? Like, do you also Okay, program? I got you now. Uh, but, but to be honest, like with a couple of additional courses, I would have felt probably pretty different going to those career fairs. Okay. Dr. John, what's, what's your input on this? Uh, before I go into my life, I do want to mention, you mentioned um, that that personal connection, both of you, of like you with Pamela and you like finding someone that you connect with and can help guide you. I want to say, keep in touch with those people. Like, you know, those of you who have chatted me already, like, keep in touch with me. Like, I am happy to stay invested in people. Um, and you should stay invested in people as well. Uh, so my sophomore year, I took algebra with that person who I quoted earlier. And then as I was finishing up grad school and I didn't know what to do and I was just freaking out, I emailed him and we've had sort of just like an email correspondence for, I don't know, a decade at this point, um, just trying to figure out what to do with our lives. Um, so it's been really nice to have someone who I had a connection with in undergrad and then just continued keeping that connection. So please maintain those. Um, right, so academia uh, on privilege. I don't know. I know what you just asked Dr. Spencer, but I definitely didn't feel prepared to get a job after undergrad. And I went to like a fancy school, but that meant that all these people were walking around my senior year in suits and they were going to their fancy interviews and I didn't have a suit. I didn't know where to get a suit. I didn't know like what they were interviewing for. So I just wanted to be a nerd and go to grad school. So that's what I did. Um, but my first year, but between undergrad and grad school, my dad died unexpectedly and suddenly. So I was just a mess. I was a complete mess. And I was underprepared for grad school as well, because again, not a math major. So I had to take some undergrad courses when I was in grad school. Um, and it was just like a really, really tough time. And I ended up transferring grad schools. So, you know, earlier you asked how do you find the right grad program? And I want to emphasize like, it doesn't have to be like, you aren't like married to that program for five years. Like you can, you can move, you can go on and find somewhere else that's better for you. Um, so I ended up just applying for grad school again. I got new letters from professors at my, at UCSB and I wanted to go to a city and I, I emailed professors in Chicago and was like, listen, I'm already in grad school, but I want to do it again. I want to find somewhere better for me. And like, I'm interested in your research. Uh, and that definitely gave me the leg up the second time around applying because they knew who I was. They knew that I could like ask coherent questions um, and ask if they were doing research. Uh, and then the other kind of alternative thing I did in grad school um, was I had kids. I had two kids. I got married and had kids actually uh, while I was in grad school. And a number of people get married, but not that many people have kids uh, because you don't really have like maternity leave or parental leave. Like there's there's not really policies in place at a lot of schools. Uh, and so I was just cobbled together. Like they threw me on some random grant and claimed that I was doing research when really I was just like breastfeeding a baby. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's never a good time to have kids with an academic career. Therefore, it's always a good time to have kids. Um, you, just, you just do things and see if they work. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Well, we only have three and a half minutes left in this segment so that to ensure that we have time for the questions from the audience. And I hear that you all have been responding to the questions in the chat. Um, so if we could spend maybe a minute, quick answer from each of you on um, how have you developed your networks? And, we, and uh, you were just talking about that. And how have you, your networks as you've navigated your pathway through academia, industry, and what are your strongest connections? Maybe a quick response from each of our panelists. I guess, um, honestly, I've been very passive in networking. A, a lot of the uh, opportunities that I've gotten have just like come 
almost happenstance. Um, I definitely recommend against that though. You should be very <laughs> active and have agency in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah that, <laughs> uh, my, my strongest connection though is definitely um, just through those uh, teams that are, teams or people that I've uh, met with and uh, connected with, uh, like Dr. Duong said, like you should invest in people and be comfortable like maintaining those investments over a long period of time. Um, the people that I talk to about potentially starting companies, the people that I've uh, like m met and you know they've gone on to have like startups. Uh, if if I'm considering like leaving Facebook or going on to the uh, going on to like some other place, a lot of the options that I'm going to be looking at are like places that my friends are at, places that people I've kept up with are currently at. Um, so yeah, that definitely keep that network and uh, stay up to date with like where your friends are in their careers. Outstanding. X? Um, yeah, uh, something I was extremely active in in grad school was women in mathematics. Uh, I organized multiple seminars and symposia. I went to like all the women in math conferences. I went to all the women in math um, conferences and such. There's like a program at IES. There's this program called EDGE, which I want all of the women and gender expansive people to know about. It's called EDGE. Find it. Um, and I just tried to keep in touch with all of those people. Oh, make a website. Number one, please make a website for yourself. That way people can find you on the internet. Um, and that's where we all hang out now. So that's probably the number one thing I did was make a website because that's where people can find me. And I'm on Twitter. Um, and I have like an email newsletter, but I just kind of inform people about what I'm doing in hopes that they will tell me what they're doing. And it's worked out. I mean, like, how am I on this panel? I think it's from my website. I don't know, or Twitter or something, <laughs> probably Twitter. Um, so yeah, like you said, just keep in touch with your friends and be friendly, <laughs> go to conferences and say hello to people. Uh, people really like to be heard, so you can just repeat back to someone what they said if you don't know what to say back, and they'll just keep talking. Uh, also, I have uh, mild prosopagnosia. I'm face blind, so I'm just like super friendly in case we've met before and I'm not sure about it. So you should also just be super friendly. In academia, I would say that I try to seek out people whose work I find really interesting and get to know who they're working with, like what they're interested in next. Um, I think like uh, people are really excited to talk to you about their work, as Dr. Duong said. Um, in industry, I would say that in addition to working really closely with certain partners, like engineering partners or other data scientists, like those are really strong connections and can lead to referrals later. But the other thing that I would say is that a lot of people who know me in industry are people who were at the same company and I went out of my way to give a talk or like a seminar on something relevant to our, our industry, right? Relevant to the problems we work on. But sometimes folks remember those talks in a way that I think creates kind of a long-term connection that can lead to future referrals, even if I'm not spending six hours a day debugging code with them. Outstanding. Well, we've exhausted this 15 minute segment. So I'm gonna skip question number three and the final question. And I'm just gonna to go to uh, a final word from our panelists. Is there an issue that has not been addressed for which you would like to share your thoughts? Um, uh, I have one. Um, so for, for students who are thinking about graduate school, once you've applied to graduate school and been invited to visit campus, in math, it's quite normal that you'll be admitted first and then you would be invited for a visit weekend. What are you trying to learn in that time when you're on campus? What are the things that are going to help you decide if that's a good match? And I would say that perhaps one of the largest hidden norms associated with graduate programs is how they understand their responsibility to students who don't have a great initial match with an advisor. Um, so in particular, 
does a program believe that it still has responsibility and ownership for the success of a student if the initial advisor match isn't a great one? And do the faculty think of the students as future peers who are worth investing in? Or are they sort of hoping to come across students who are just geniuses who already understand their highly particular field? So you're really looking for a program where their attitude is that they're eager to invest in the students and that that investment is not dependent on the first research experience with an advisor going perfectly. So ask, ask about how often people leave without a degree, ask about what happens to students who want to switch advisors, um, ask those questions of the students and the faculty when you're on the visit. Outstanding. Um, I'm going to share my screen if that's cool. Uh, here we go. Um, it can be really lonely to be the only person who looks like you in a room. Um, often I would be the only woman in a room. Sometimes I'd be the only person of a color in a room. So uh, I'd say if you fit in one of those categories or similar categories, try to find your people. I loved being at EDGE, which I mentioned earlier. It was literally the first time in my life that I've been taught math by a woman, if you don't count my substitute teacher in fifth grade. So that was, that was a lot. That was really cool. Um, here are some other programs uh, and such that I was part of. Um, and there's also other programs for underrepresented minorities in math. And I'd say make that network uh, probably the thing that helped me finish grad school was having a network of peers, like a peer support network of people who are going through the same thing and also knew what it was like to be in similar shoes. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is that you should swim in your own lane. Um, like Dr. Spencer said earlier, it's not like you have to have like a dream and stick with it for 30 years. That's not how things go anymore. Like, don't worry about what other people are doing. Just do what you feel like. Do what you want to do. Um, and don't compare your successes or failures to other people's successes and failures. So that's, that's all I have to say about that. That was a brilliantly said last word. Um, I don't need to share my screen again. So Anthony, what's, what, what, how would you like to weigh in on this? Um, kind of uh, riffing on the last thing Dr. Gawang said is, um, yeah, not being worried about uh, comparing yourself to other people or, you know, actually having a plan. I feel like I have uh, a lot of different things on my resume, each of them like very different from the last. And it just became, it just happened that way because I just took opportunities that came for me and sought them out and kind of any anytime that there was a, a an application that said like you needed this credential or, you know, this amount of experience, I kind of just hand waved and applied anyway. Um, there, yeah, there are so many untapped opportunities that you can get that way and kind of just remaining open to them is how I've, how I've been moving through my career. Outstanding. Well, I would like to thank our panelists for your outstanding insight. 